Okay, uh, I think uh, there's still a few participants to connect to the session. I see that a few are joining now, but in the interest of time, I think we can uh, get this started with the session and then others will join. Uh, welcome everyone to day three of GCA's masterclass on climate resilient PPPs. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, uh, especially after all, all those days of sessions and long hours that we had already throughout the week. Uh, I think it has been very interesting. Uh, we started talking about uh, the opportunity to integrate resilience into PVPs, uh, how we can assess climate risks to infrastructure, how we can plan investments under uncertainty conditions, or what are like, some of the key financing mechanisms uh, that we can use or to finance resilient infrastructure, uh, how we can integrate nature-based solutions uh, as, as part of the resilience options and PVPs, uh, and today we are also going to talk about two very important topics, which are tender and performance requirements and stakeholder engagements for resilient PPPs. Uh, just to explain a bit of how the session will be structured today, uh, you have been seeing David as the moderator, but today he will actually be able to share a bit of his expertise, uh, and therefore I will be taking a bit of that uh, moderation role. Uh, but to start the session of today, I would like to introduce uh, Giselles, Giselles Saralegi uh, and Felipe Neves. Uh, they both have been very supportive of, of these initiatives. And so I'd like also to thank uh, them for, for all the inputs that they have provided to the handbook uh, and this initiative in, in general. Uh, we, we are really pleased with that support. So just to introduce uh, them, uh, Giselle works at the International Finance Corporation, IFC. And she has extensive experience on, on emerging market, private sector debt, and equity finance, uh, infrastructure finance, and as well as PPP advisory. Uh, Felipe works at the Public Private Infrastructure Advisory Facility, PIAF, and he has uh, a lot of experience on, on private, invest private investments and concessionaries, as well as uh, in, in governments, uh, and in financing and advising infrastructure and PPP projects. So without uh, further ado, I will let, uh, give the floor to Giselle and Felipe. They'll be able to share the presentation and uh, hope share some insights of this important topic with you. So thank you, uh, Giselle and Felipe. The floor is yours. Wonderful. Um, Danilo, a big thank you to you and to the Global Center on Adaptation for um, this invitation. It's a wonderful opportunity to be able to speak to you uh, about topics that were really um, uh, close at heart, which are uh, climate change and PPP solutions. Uh, even better when we get to integrate them all into one. Um, and so today um, we do want to speak to you about PPP solutions through a climate lens. Uh, and we have a great opportunity, I think, to uh, shed some important light, um, certainly in what we call the tender and award phase, where critical aspects of contract uh, considerations um, and, and other metrics and requirements uh, become really critical. But we wanted to start you off with uh, an important first start, which is better understanding how climate change is creating a hard reality. Um, and that reality is really seen uh, with what we are seeing uh, around the globe. So greenhouse gas concentrations at the highest levels in 2 million years. I cannot emphasize the, the importance of uh, what we are seeing um, in reality. And these emissions continue to rise. Um, we've seen the last decade as the warmest on record. And maybe many people think, well, climate change mainly means warmer temperatures. The reality is that the consequences of climate change now include intense droughts, water scarcity, severe fires, rising sea levels, flooding, melting polar ice caps, catastrophic storms and declining biodiversity. The map that you see here on the screen to the right really sheds light on the um, extreme hazards and risk scores that we see not just in one country, but around the globe. Uh, and as you can see, most of the maps scattered with high and very high risks that include wildfires, flooding, heat, hurricanes, sea level rise and water. This is the reality in which we are now beginning to look at how do we tackle and how do we address um, the Paris Agreement and climate change. That brings us to another important um, next um, slide, uh, which we want to kind of uh, share with you. So 
all of that climate hazard um, has a tremendous impact. And it's uh, really interesting to see some analysis that Swiss Re, for example, has done, where you see the world economy set to lose up to 18%. Let me pause there. 18% of GDP from climate change if no action is taken. That's a staggering amount. Um, if you navigate over to your right and look at reported economic losses over the last few decades, what you see is those uh, increasing dramatically. Um, and even other shocking numbers that we see, um, again, from Swiss Re in this case, climate risks are, are expected to add 183 billion to property insurance costs by 2040. This is staggering. Um, the impacts are real. And so the questions for all of us are how do we actually tackle those? And what do they mean in terms of investments that we need to make to turn um, this around to help us um, avoid the tipping point in climate? Giselle, on, on this one, um, can you elaborate on how much of a difference does it make for uh, PPP contracts being uh, structured in uh, emerging and developing countries? Um, th does that affect investors' views and then how um, uh, PPPs need to be shaped? Really great questions. Yes, they do, because it's beginning to shape um, uh, key issues that we're going to explore a bit more in contract from force majeure to uh, availability of insurance and ultimately to a key factor, which is financing, the availability of financing as credit committees around the world are becoming much more attuned to the risks and mitigation issues. So climate change is not something that we can avoid. It is something that we need to tackle head on and will have incredible and important implications for how we look at structuring private sector investment through PPPs. Um, and I'd like to maybe touch on what is that global context and why does it matter? So I think what we're seeing really here is a confluence of factors coming to play that are really driving this global context for all of us, uh, really all of us around the globe. So what are we seeing? Governments are ramping up Paris Agreement pledges um, and with the new five-year cycle, um, it's an, an important time to refocus, particularly in a run-up to the climate COP26 meetings this fall. We're also seeing corporations reacting and also trying to get ahead of the curve in terms of legislation. Last year alone, we saw 155 companies with a market capitalization of 2.4 trillion signing a statement calling on policymakers to ensure net zero emissions by 2050. But they, they didn't just ask the policymakers to do that. What we've seen now is a wave of, of corporations also announcing that they will tackle the net zero and, and be net zero. Um, so these are important transitions. Then we move to climate legislation standards and regulations, and all of those have been advancing. Uh, we are seeing them really drive a global focus on climate for corporations, to investors, and beyond. Um, interesting to note, uh, important efforts uh, driven by the G20 with the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, PCFD. These are meant to develop voluntary and consistent climate-related financial uh, risk disclosures. And we'll touch on this a little bit later, but these are all critical parts of what is becoming the uh, kind of standards and legislative process around it. Why does this all matter? Because it's also impacting financing. And what we're seeing is financing is going green. There's a growing global market for climate and sustainable finance. It was fascinating to see it grow to almost 6 billion, uh, 600 billion last year. And that was almost a twofold growth from the uh, prior year. So it's an exploding market, uh, which is good news. And we are seeing that corporations and financial institutions are adopting uh, green lending and bond principles. Uh, also adopting uh, climate reporting and tapping into this expanding market. That's an important factor here that we need to consider. Um, we already spoke to you about the uh, global climate impact and risks and how those are growing. Uh, IPCC report, uh, the sixth uh, climate assessment report that just came out, really, I, I think, um, was a call to action. Uh, climate change, uh, as they said, is widespread, rapid, and intensifying, and they do anticipate it going beyond the 1.5 degrees if we do not act. So we are seeing these global impacts. We've seen uh, them 
through the floods, the fires, the droughts um, that are really hitting across the globe and how that's translating into loss of life, livelihood, physical assets, uh, destruction and beyond. So what does this all mean for us? If we really do want to achieve climate change and the goals of Paris Agreement, there's a rough estimate of anywhere from three to five trillion in infrastructure investment needs to reach those goals. Uh, unless we want, uh, and we want to really avoid reaching that uh, climate tipping point. So this is really the important backdrop to why it is all relevant to the PPP world. And when we want to bring in private sector investment and financing, the reality as we come out of a pandemic world is that uh, fiscal constraints are meaning more and more that we're needing to look at private sector and finance to fill those gaps and to reach this uh, critical investment uh, need. So if we can segue to the next, um, I think we'll take off with an overview of what you've been covering all this week. Um, you've already covered um, project identification phase, um, the appraisal phase, and today we really want to talk to you about um, GCA, um, how they label the tender and award phase. And it's at this stage where we're really embedding climate into PPP contracts, into KPIs, into tender. And this stage really offers an opportunity uh, for the project team to embed, evaluate, and develop climate resilience considerations, as well as mitigation um, into the design um, and contract aspects. Um, uh, also looking at how do we look at qualifying bidders and the tendering of the project and evaluating those bids. Uh, really these climate resilient measures into PPP contracts are, are, are vital and they're uh, a key part of evaluating the bids. And I think that's something that we need to look at. There's a, an underlying question though, project teams do need to consider bankability um, and that really may temper uh, private sector investment. So there's a, a delicate balance between risk and rewards that we have to navigate um, here. And I think what will be important to uh, understand is that it is a um, important um, evolution that's happening here. Um, in the earlier stages, we talk about earlier project appraisal um, stage. Um, we've uh, completed a climate risk ass assessment at that point, and um, ideally also analyzed kind of the quantitative and qualitative um, aspects of climate risk to embed in the project um, and look at um, how it impacts future scenarios. The ideal goal here is to really embed uh, resilience options with cost analysis of what those op uh, options have in terms of implications and for the financial modeling. Um, so really these are, are critical aspects. Philippe, um, thoughts around um, kind of this uh, phase before we get into some of the particulars, um, reactions um, as well. So here we go, and Philippe, I think you're going to take us through here, but when we begin to look at kind of the next key stages um, in this process, the contract um, stage is a critical one. We're going to explore in the next few slides, things like force majeure, mechanisms, and standards. Uh, so Philippe, help us understand force majeure. Uh, what does that mean? And, and what are the implications for PPPs? Thanks, thanks Giselle, and, and in fact, the. Um... Uh, we're taking the, the topic from the end um, precisely because in general, um, uh, in particular, when it comes to uh, resilience and, and, uh, and uh, answer to disaster, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's often uh, taken as a, a non-prepared situation where you have to react to what is happening. And, um, and, and that's the, the, the mind shift uh, that is needed there. So uh, if, if we look at force measure, these are very uh, usual um, uh, um, clauses in, in PPP contracts. And, um, and as, as you know, um, you have uh, compensation events uh, for which the private sector is compensated in case of those happening. Uh, you have relief events uh, which, uh, uh, the, the, for which the private sector has to, um, to be strong from a financial perspective just to, um, um, to, uh, to delay a bit the, 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 the works and so on as, as needed, but they are compensated for the, for, for the for the rest, and then you have the force measure part, uh, uh, where um, when something um, happens that is beyond the control of, of the of the parties, um, that there is some uh, some ways contractually to uh, to organize these. 
And, and as we know, the challenge with climate change is uh, when we think about uh, foreseeable, unforeseeable, uh, insurable, non-insurable aspects, climate change is making a lot of difference uh, on how on how this is going to um, to, to work. Um, so uh, the, the fact of just uh, uh, letting it, uh, if, I, if I exaggerate a bit, for the lawyers to organize it in, in a contract is, is no more something that, uh, that, that is feasible. We need to tackle from the beginning, from a technical, financial uh, and legal perspective, um, this, this type of, um, of, of challenges. Um, so in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I would say uh, one main takeaway, and I hope the, the one main message to go will be, uh, we need to shift this mindset from ex post to ex ante thinking. Uh, if um, if we take um, another um, another view there in terms of how things are uh, are happening at the end of the contract or at the end of uh, of some events, uh, we um, we see that there there can be variation and renegotiation. Um, they uh, there are the elements of changing law. I, I want to stop a bit on on this one. Uh, let's assume a country is is working on a. Uh, it's uh, legislation regarding uh, resiliency and, and some norms that you, you want to have for buildings or other things. Um, and let's assume you, you sign a PPP contract today and then you change that law tomorrow. Uh, then the, uh, the challenge is, well, you, you, you have signed something for 25 or 30 years and the private sector needed to have some uh, visibility and certainty of, of the cash flows to, um, uh, to move on. So the, this change in law needs to be um, treated, eventually compensated in a way. And, and so if you haven't thought of all of that uh, upfront, you, you'll have some issues related to, and that's the left side of, of, the, uh, of the slide, um, dispute resolution processes, uh, and other arbitration uh, elements that, that you may need eventually for that if it's not uh, correctly addressed in the contract. And, and for that, then uh, you may have several options. You can delay the, the, the PPP contract a bit, the tendering process, so, so that you are clear on the law, or you can maybe start um, uh, seeing how you can put some options or, or, or accounts or so to try and manage this uncertainty. But of course, it may at best uh, be just costly, and at worst, it can create some um, uncertainty in the contract that then makes the contract not not um, uh, not bankable or not even uh, uh, investable from an uh, from an investor perspective. Uh, I don't know here if Giselle, you want to add a bit. Yeah, I think you know the challenge here is that when you think about bankability and you think about investors and financiers, uh, investors want to have um, while they're putting equity at risk, and, and certainly that is at risk. There is also a, a return hurdle that that they have uh, and return expectations, uh, and that's critical uh, for them. The financiers obviously have an embedded um, at need for debt service uh, repayment structures. And so changes in variability in cash flows become a real issue. Um, and, and so uh, really, uh, these are aspects that are looked at, uh, hence why we began to look at mechanisms as well that you know, either provide relief or compensation. But um, it is uh, a certainty that with climate change, we are going to have a change over the life of these types of assets, which, uh, which obviously have longer lives. So, it is a dance of sorts uh, and one that really does require a much more uh, negotiated approach um, uh, to look at what are best solutions here. Um, yes, and, and well, Del Delphine, I, I just saw your, your comment. I mean, and yes, fully, fully agreeing with you. First, uh, probably uh, sponsor investors are the, the scarce ones. Um, uh, if a project is well structured, it, it, it will find banks and and then back bankability will will follow but but indeed uh, we need to think of all um, uh, all that and uh, the, uh, the one key issue there is to see what what is about equity and what is about debt in terms of the risk allocation within the the private uh, the private consortium um, then um, the uh, if we move to the to the next uh, yeah oh, back to you uh, Giselle on this one Thank you. So we've talked about FM and um, mechanisms. Um, another uh, and really important trend that's coming up is really climate resilience has really increasingly, uh, increasingly becoming mainstreamed into international design codes, financial reporting, and due diligence. Um, so again, um, critical things that are coming up in the financial standards world, which are important from a PPP perspective, looking at, uh, for example, green bond, uh, bond principles, 
for sustainable bonds. These apply also to the lending aspects. And if you want to tap into uh, more liquid markets that are rapidly developing, uh, being able to look at these principles and begin to embed them into kind of PPP structures may be a critical path forward to even be able to tap into financing. We mentioned earlier on um, the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures, which uh, put together a framework uh, for corporations, for uh, financial institutions and beyond that really look at governance, strategy, risk management and metrics and targets. Um, other critical factors that you might want to begin to consider and embed um, into kind of structures. Um, so these design standards, including um, environmental and social safeguards are really an opportunity to kind of specify clear design standards or safeguards um, that the project should meet for increased uh, resilience. Um, and we recognize that each country may have specific engineering construction and other standards and codes. Uh, but these are evolving, um, and I think that's one of the key messages that we're going to continue to share uh, with all of you. Um, over to the right, uh, we have a table here that just highlights um, some of the standards that we're seeing. For example, EDGE, um, if you're trying to build resilience uh, into um, buildings and real estate assets um, uh, is, is crit uh, critical there. Um, ISO standards that look at um, uh, helping sustainable cities and communities um, and establish uh, practices to recover from and adapt to shocks. Um, sure standard, um, uh, you know, again, building uh, sustainable and resilient infrastructure and other key rating systems and labels like Envision and FAST are, are quickly developing. Frankly, there's a plethora of these out in the market, but beginning to look at how you embed these into the contractual structures is key. So, for example, on an airport project, um, we were finance advising on and then financing. Uh, there was a key contractual requirement to uh, uh, build in um, lead certification for building uh, resilience and efficiencies. These are some of the typical things that you will want to consider uh, when you look at uh, contractual mechanisms as well. Philippe. So um, back to the, um, the, 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 the core on the tender process. So the, precisely the challenge is how can we uh, crystallize all this both in the contract itself and in the, the rest of the, uh, the, the, the material which are RFQ and RFP requests for qualification and requests for proposals. Um, and uh, well, one, uh, uh, first idea that comes to mind is clearly the design of projects. We can also think of evaluation criteria uh, eventually to better uh, address climate uh, climate aspects. So I, I would like us to um, to pause a bit and to see uh, if um, uh, each one can think of what can be the tools that you can use to to make it happen uh, when it comes to embedding climate into the the contract. Um, and uh, so again, design is a very powerful one. Historically, it has been the, the, the strongest, but it's not the only one. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go to some of the answers in the, in the, in the next slide. Um, those are of different nature on the left side, um, and, um, and not all of them are to be taken as a, as a given solution, and I'll explain why. So uh, we've already talked about design and technical aspects. Um, in terms of contractual clauses, you have seen how uh, we, we need to think about uh, force majeure, uh, uh, for instance, and, uh, and, and there are examples. I, I really like uh, what, what is the, the case of Japan. It's about earthquakes, but it's a, a, a case where because of, if you remember what happened in, in Sendai in terms of earthquake and, uh, and tsunami, they have improved uh, the force majeure clause by indicating very concretely some levels of earthquake uh, under which it's not considered a force majeure and it's a private sector responsibility to move forward with that. So there is a full effort, again, ex ante to do on contractual clauses. We talked about insurance, uh, which is a kind of second layer behind the, the, the clauses of the contract. We can think of uh, financial structuring uh, with uh, elements such as um, accounts dedicated for contingency related to climate change. Um, this one is, is, for instance, a sort of question mark in the sense that um, financiers do not like to have money uh, frozen in, in, in such accounts, so it can put more pressure in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the process itself. 
and, and maybe make the project uh, either uh, non-bankable or more costly than, than what would be needed. So, so here, the, instead of providing these solutions to you, the idea is really for us to see what what can be the the different ways, uh, what can and, and and how what you need to think up front to make it to make it happen. Uh, I wanted to um to um, uh, indicate two other ones. One is KPIs, um, the the indicators. You have examples on on the right. Uh, and for instance, if we go to the bottom one, it's very clear and very specific. And this is a very nice way to exactly state what the need can be and what the objective and the output objective is from the, the public sector perspective. But then also comes the last point I, I, I wanted to make on that, which, which is the, the market testing um, and, and also the, the competitive dialogue. It, it can have different meanings depending on the countries and so on. But let's say the tender process, if you're not fully clear about what you want to do, uh, you, you, you can have through uh, questions and answers with the private bidders or other means, a way to, to for instance, um, fine tune uh, the clause. If we think of this clause on, on electricity transmission network, you, you may be not realistic uh, or it may be too costly if you insist on a certain number of hours and a, a certain type of climate hazard. So having uh, the possibility to integrate the feedback during the tender process will allow you to get to a better contract at the end. Wonderful. And Philippe, so I, I think we've got some really interesting um, messages and conclusions we'd like to wrap up with you here. Um, do you want to walk us through uh, some of these first points? And Yes. So, um, uh, well, uh, one key point is uh, the, the alignment with the, the Paris Agreement goals. Um, it, it's not only uh, 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 for best in class, it's really needed uh, because of scarcity of uh, uh, of, uh, of in investors uh, and because of the difficulties of climate change, investors will not go for projects that are not well uh, aligned and, and well addressing these, these issues. Um, another point is also that uh, the delivering private sector investment and, and finance through PPP uh, climate smart solutions is an opportunity to meet investment needs uh, in, in the challenging uh, uh, context that, that we have now, but also full of, uh, of opportunities. Um, on taxonomies and standards, um, Giselle, you talked a lot uh, on, on, on the different, uh, on the full array of possibilities that exist. These things will be more and more needed because investors want to see those in contracts and, want, and will have to report on them anyway. So it needs to be embedded so that it eases the, uh, that, that, that process. Um, uh, shall I uh, pass it on to you? Yes, and, and so, um, Philippe, you've just covered um, the importance of integrating climate change, both mitigation and resilience options into PPPs, and how do we do that? Through design, through metrics, through reporting into contracts, um, all into contracts in the tender process. Um, building into contracts key mechanisms that we also explored, dispute mechanisms, variation mechanisms, and contingency plannings are all key aspects that help uh, more firmly embed uh, the climate lens uh, into that. Then there's also, I, I think, um, you know, the hallmark here is really rapid uh, uh, evolution and innovation, and these are really the hallmarks of climate change. Um, the ability to continue to adapt with these changes will be key, um, and a certain flexibility of approach is fundamental. Um, and there's a really delicate balancing game here between risks and rewards. We talked about the issue of bankability earlier. Philippe, um, maybe wrapping up with the final points. Yes, well, the, I, I, I cannot insist too much on my favorite idea of trying to think ex ante inst instead of ex post. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, that's really a strong message that uh, that I would have. Um, and um, and then, yeah, I mean, the uh, the entire uh, um, set of stakeholders is moving in in, the, in that uh, in that field. I, I know there can be a lot of questions on uh, um, uh, the, the tension between this and other priorities that public sector may have, uh, but uh, but definitely. Uh, we cannot do without it. And, and maybe again, taking one of the comments that, that we, we, we read, uh, bankability cannot happen without sustainability. Um, so so if for projects to become bankable or to remain bankable, we'll have to integrate these dimensions anyway. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. So that was a whirlwind coverage um, uh, on a really important topic and, and a complex one, which is, is looking at that contract structuring, uh, that tendering process and that award. Um, we're happy to uh, take questions now and, um, uh, and explore a little bit more in depth with you.
Thank you very much, Gisela and Felipe, for this very insightful presentation. Uh, and I, I like the way you, you swift around between the two of you to complement each other. It was very nice. Uh, now I have I see that the, in the chat we have some some questions, and I would like to invite uh, everyone to to turn on their cameras, perhaps for a more interactive discussion between all of us. Uh, and to start with the questions, uh, I saw that uh, not going in a particular order. I saw that Felipe answered the first question from Delfina, I believe. Uh, and Delfina, you had a, a follow-up question uh, on related to, to nature-related disclosure task force. So perhaps would you like to, to unmute yourself and, and ask, uh, turn on your camera and ask the question to Giselle and Felipe? Yeah, hi. Thanks, um, Felipe, for answering earlier my question, my first question. And then, um, when I was listening to Giselle at some point, when you were talking about the TCFD at some point, I started thinking that- If you allow me, I have also another call on the background because I'm actually doing training on climate resilient. Um, if you- Apologies for that. Sorry, <laughs> please go ahead, Delfina. Um, no, um, I was thinking that there was a, recently a few months, uh, several months ago, the. Um, Nature Related Disclosure Task Force was launched as a mirror, not as a mirror, but following a little bit the pathway of the TCFD. And I thought that would be really, it could be really interesting to help mobilize the more nature complex issues into PPPs and into the financing of infrastructure. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about this. It's just like very out of the blue comments, but I was triggered by some of the comments. Uh, really good questions. And what we didn't go into uh, kind of in a granular way is what are um, options for building resilience? Um, and clearly you can do those through design and, and integrating aspects there. Uh, and different options, but one of those is frankly nature-based solutions. Um, and I think to the extent that we can embed nature-based solutions, we're going to help create uh, an ecosystem that is much um, uh, much better adapt uh, as well. And, and so I, I do think uh, it is an important aspect for every PPP to look at the, Im the broader impact on the ecosystem and how that ecosystem can also help build that resilience. In fact, it may create some cost savings perspectives. Um, I, I've often heard, um, you know, sea level rising and, and the creation of mangroves um, as, as some solutions um, and, and the examples abound. But uh, yes, I, I do think it's an important. You touched on also, um, uh, and I think what we tried to convey is uh, new standards, new taxonomies, it's taking off in a way that is dizzying, frankly. Um, so what we're hoping to see uh, with efforts like the G7 and G20 is that ideally we're going to see a convergence so that when we're all uh, literally trying to advance and structure, we've got a sense for which standards should I be applying? And those are the more difficult questions I think we're probably all asking ourselves as well. Some have gained more traction uh, in the market. TCFD is being adopted. Um, things like the uh, green bond principles, um, social and sustainable bonds are absolutely critical. And that's that 600 billion kind of market that, that is exploding. Um, so those are ones that have taken more traction, others perhaps less, but. Um... Oh, it is true that the green bond principles were launched in 2014. So it's been a while. So good that they were gaining traction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's no, that's great. Thank you for that. And uh, I see that also, Paul, uh, you have a question uh, in the chat uh, about um, more related to, to standards, perhaps. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask the questions to the Cell and Felipe? Yeah, I wanted to find out in the presentation, there was a statement about uh, design tools and all that. So I just wanted to find out if, let's say, GNC or the World Bank or any of these organizations kind of have an existing uh, I say, template or a certain standard of what these schools do with respect to building or do now when it comes to climate space or having infrastructure that can be resilient. Mm -hmm. Line of this 
climate change adaptation issue? Um, you know, it's a really interesting, challenging question um, because I think um, this field is evolving and evolving very rapidly. So we've showcased some of the key standards that are out there. Um, if you're looking at buildings, um, you've got edge and lead and bream um, that you could use um, uh, that require, you know, have certain requirements and metrics that you need to meet. Um, there are also um, uh, some of the others, uh, sure, um, the fast label that are developing around infrastructure assets as well. Um, so I don't, when I said to you, we'd like to see a convergence around the gold standards, the best practices, uh, because right now there's a growing field that's trying to help uh, deliver answers. So I, we don't use one standard or another. Um, I think uh, we're really exploring what is working uh, and creating that flexibility of approach, at least until there's more of a convergence around um, certain standards, if I can say. Philippe, other thoughts around that? Yes, well, uh, so um, uh, some of them, and, um, and, and Giselle, you mentioned those SURE um, and Vision, also ISCA in Australia, which, which are very active in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Asia. Uh, they, they came to us in PPIF, and uh, we have been working for the last uh, two years on a, on, on a set of indicators that, uh, that we mean uh, to be uh, uh, necessary but not sufficient. They, they will be published in, uh, in October. Um, so it's, it's one way. Uh, they just realized that even though there are different um, uh, uh, companies or, or nonprofits, uh, there is, of course, a, a common basis, common ground there. Um, so th that, that's a show of, of convergence and, uh, and willingness to uh, um, to, um, to, to to show that those topics on sustainability are important. Thank you for that. Uh, and I think it's indeed a very important topic, uh, something that GC is, is, is also working on. I'm going to, to share a link here with you in the chat later. Uh, but I think we do have time for one last uh, question at this point uh, before we can move on to the next presentation. And then, of course, we still have time for more discussions in the end. So I'd like to give the opportunity to Dan Lamy, if you can uh, kindly unmute yourself and uh, ask uh, your question, please. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you, uh, Danilo. Thank you, Giselle and Philippe. Sorry, uh, while you were speaking, and I think it's sort of along the lines of other uh, respondents, uh, the question was very simply, to what extent is incorporating these standards um, going to affect the risk rating of the project itself as a pure PPP um, because of country risk issues and things like that. Because if you talk about the bonds that we mentioned, if a government goes directly to bond finance, then that's no longer maybe a PPP um, because uh, you know the governments that do the scoop models to fund things and things like that. So if it's going to sort of enter into a PPP structure, I was just wondering, would something like that re reduce the risk rating of the project and hence the risk premium and cost or is it, uh, would this, it still be high? And then that brings us back to then why, <laughs> you know? So thank you, know, you. Really good question. So uh, yes, the answer is um, what it's helping to do is um, helping address um, the risks um, in the project and, and creating this structure is also helping investors better address their, the questions from their own shareholders that are driving this as well as financial institutions. Now, for example, on the sustainable linked, uh, which are uh, tied to the SDGs, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, um, there's actually uh, a cost efficiency because you're seeing with these metrics, they're stepped down in pricing. So um, it's a wonderful benefit to say, if you can tap into this market, uh, even on the sustainable linked, you have a cost benefit. Um, I think the flip side of what you're also going to see is if you're not addressing risks, climate risks, and not creating uh, adaptive measures within your design, you're going to have a harder time going out to get financing. That's going to be the hard reality because financial institutions are much more closely looking at risk uh, investors are, are looking at risk. The last thing want, they want to do is put equity at risk of, of total loss if it has not been designed in a way that's going to be able to address, you know, not the one in uh, a 100 year storm, but the fact that these are now coming every two years, um, the frequency and, and the, the strength. So yes, these are, are critical to really help um, address the risk in that. Philippe, would you add anything there or? No, no, that, that's, um, yes. 
Great, thank you. And I saw that there's still a couple more questions there in the chat, but uh, I'm noting them down and I'll be sure to, to ask you at the open discussions in the end. Uh, now I would like to give thanks. So thank you very much, Giselle and Felipe and everyone uh, for the participation. Uh, now I would like to give the, the floor to uh, David. Uh, you, have met it, you have met David before uh, from the opening ceremony. But uh, if, if you didn't listen to that, uh, David is a senior PPP advisor at the International Sustainable Resilience Center uh, and also member of the steering committee of the World Association of PPP Units and Practitioners. Uh, and today, David, uh, besides moderating the sessions in the other days, as I mentioned, he will be able to share a little bit more of his experience and specifically on the topic of stakeholder engagement. So David, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. This is a different role and I relish it. It's nice to be able to talk and not just to have to listen all the time. Um, this morning we had <clears throat> a very good session as well with your um, fellow um, um, workshop um, companions. And I'm going to be talking about um, stakeholder engagement in PPPs and the challenges. And in, instead of getting very theoretical, because I'm a very practical person, I'm going to also focus on a practical example of a real life project. And what was interesting about the real life project, um, which takes, which you'll hear a bit more about, which is taking place in the area close to where I live in Virginia, was that the one of your participants from Namibia said that it was really nice to hear about problems that a project's experiencing in an advanced economy, and that it's not just unique to um, emerging economies. So that was uh, an interesting perspective. In the um, handbook, um, the whole idea of stakeholders and involvement in climate resilient PPPs is a critical um, aspect. I did a count and stakeholders is mentioned at least 70 times in the document. So it's scattered throughout and it's woven throughout as a golden thread. We all know that PPPs are a long-term contract between a private party and a government entity for providing a public service or an asset. And that's the general term that people use. It is also um, interesting to take note that this is a situation where parties share risk. And this is why it's important that the stakeholders understand one another and that they are remunerated or rewarded according to their performance. So PPPs are complex partnerships between stakeholders and there are two levels, we'll look at that. But there's the primary you know, parties which are involved, those who are actually involved in the contract. And then secondary, as I'd called stakeholders, it, which could be external audiences who are in, interested in the project and then tangentially or even directly impacted. But it's important to understand that each stakeholder, no matter where they are, where they come from, where they stand, will experience project risk differently and also having different expected outcomes or expectations from the project. And this is what makes it really difficult when you're managing stakeholders and understanding what they're doing. It's also important that if you are going to reach out to stakeholders that you do it in a, in a fair way. And this means effective communication and transparency. And transparency means in the sense of the messages that you share are not just shared with certain groups, but are shared with everyone. Um, so there's a number of um, interactions during stakeholder engagement. It's a complex web in many ways of different parties being involved with one another. But there are benefits of engaging stakeholders. Different stakeholders and different interested parties can provide detailed information that we might not be aware of. And they also are a source of great innovation. And it would be foolhardy to ignore these. They can also help, especially in the visualization and planning phase of the project. They can provide detailed information. I mean, sorry, they can provide um, details on the prioritization of resilience options in projects. And the handbook talks about this. They can also help understand whether the project will deliver value for society, you know, value for money, bankability, et cetera, and co-benefits. The benefits should not just be about the PPP partners who are involved, but it should also involve the benefits to the users and outside communities. And then also, you know, really focusing, focusing on understanding interdependencies that exist, 
no one exists in a vacuum. Every project exists in a real life, real world context. And also we can help, you know, understand the commonalities. And then if there is compromise that's necessary to reach um, or to move forward on a project, also trade-offs on that project. As you can see on this um, slide, there are a number of stakeholders. The IFC um, identifies stakeholders as persons or groups who are directly or indirectly affected by a project, as well as those who might have an interest. So this opens a wide spectrum of um, interested parties. On the table on the right-hand side, you can see, for example, that when we talk about climate resilience, there are specific um, stakeholders. When we talk about PPPs, there are specific stakeholders. But these stakeholders all overlap. I would not see them as two separate groups, but these are overlapping stakeholders. Um, one thing I do want to stress that sometimes people mix stakeholders up with the term of partner in the sense of a PPP, a partner is the, are the groups that are contractually involved in the project. And you know, they have certain important roles to play, especially when it comes to the performance of the contract and delivery. And this should not be confused with stakeholders because stakeholders are interested in impacted parties but they um, also can at times, if, they, if you misunderstand the difference between a partner and a stakeholder, can cause confusion in the communication process. Stakeholders are relevant no matter what you're looking at. We've talked about it, they're different from the public and the private sector. And one thing that I want to stress with PPPs, this is a partnership, an ongoing partnership between the public and private sector. It's not privatization. As soon as you privatize a project, you are narrowing the stakeholders to mainly just users and one party, which in this case would be a private sector in institution. Um, so what is important is constantly, as the handbook says, and my experience has shown, that you've got to have a fine balance between managing the expectations of all parties when it comes to climate resilience. Parties will have different ideas, different viewpoints, different approaches, different perceptions, different ideas, and they can't always all be at, at, um, answered, but you've got to work closely together. What is important also is that we need to understand that there are stakeholder specific roles, but there are also cumulative and collaborative roles. I took the four sections in the handbook, which explore the roles of the public partner, the private partner, lenders and end, end users, and just created a summary here. But these roles also overlap. So don't try and see them in silos, but we understand specifically the public partners are very interested in executing PPP procurements. They also you know, support the integration of climate resilience, and that could be by um, request or by design or by standard. And they also work, you know, it's their responsibility to work projects towards climate readiness. The private sector is in a difficult position at times, but it's signed up, it's won the contract or the award in the PPP, and they're responsible for delivering the project. And this is where listening to stakeholders at time can help them do it better. And they also have to leverage monitoring and evaluation. Lenders, you know, are changing. You've heard previous speakers saying that lenders are having great expectations. They're revisiting climate um, finance, green bonds, however you want to describe it. But one thing is that it's important is that they also need to talk about what they're expecting and the whole life cycle optimization, for example. And the end users, unfortunately, in many instances are ignored or forgotten. And we need to remember that every project, whether it is an infrastructure project or whether it's a social service project, is directed at end users. So it's also important that they understand the benefits of the project, they understand why you are doing certain things, and they should be part of this communication um, cycle. So in general, the handbook also talks about an overview of specific stakeholder roles in four phases, between the project identification phase, the project appraisal phase, the tender and award phase, and the contract management phase. And you can see that there are specific roles for the public partner, the end users. But what is important is, again, just to stress that this needs to take place in tandem. So during project identification, you know, there's a very specific role of the, pub, of the public partner and also the end user. If you don't work with the end user and you don't give them a sense of where they're going and what's happening, they will find themselves, you know, you could have a project that people don't want. And then especially we had um, previous speakers talk about contract management, you know, how you deliver it, what the expectations are, et cetera. 
There's also a need for a clear stakeholder engagement plan. I'm amazed at how many projects or um, organizations that I've worked with that are running projects that when you ask them, well, how are you engaging with your stakeholder? What is your plan? They don't have one. It's important specifically in PPPs because there's so many different stakeholders coming at the project from different aspects, different ideas, different responsibilities, different expectations and different deliverables. And you can see again that they're in the four phases of the um, project that they have different roles, but the plan should at least have, you know, identifying projects, risk screening, you know, does cl um, climate and disaster risk assessments, developing performance requirements and KPIs as we discussed earlier on and then what is really important which is often neglected the monitoring and evaluation of the project so we need a stakeholder in the stakeholder communication plan but we also have this situation where you know we need to have a communication strategy and i want to stress strategy not just an afterthought which asks the why who the what's the hows and the whens and you can see this also i'm not going to read this to you but it's important that uh, communication is good Poor communication leads to false rumors or false ideas or wrong news about projects, which can escalate and create ongoing problems. Communication should also be carefully coordinated. And as again, I will stress, conducted with transparency. Every time you leave out somebody, you are creating a challenge. And then also what is important that we can understand that if we have a good communication strategy and a good communication plan, that this can prevent certain things from happening, their benefits. It can pre pre prevent pre um, delays in projects. And you'll see the example I'm gonna talk about, which where things went wrong here, can also provide evidence that the government is committed to the project. There's nothing worse than you're in a situation where people wonder if the government even supports a project. And then also, you know, if there are queries and there are questions from the uh, you know different stakeholders, if you have a good communication strategy and framework, it will help people understand that their queries and information are going to be, or the, their information needs are being answered. The project that I'm going to talk about is a project in my area, just outside. Um, I live in Virginia, in the next state, in Maryland which is a purple line project. Um, it's been in the news constantly, even just this morning, there were two new news briefings on the project. It's become controversial and it has faced a tremendous amount of challenges. Um, it, the project was launched with the intention of, and good intentions, and the project is still good, I believe, but was you know, sold on the sense of big environmental benefits as well to the community surrounding them. And basically this tied into a lot of the awareness of you know, climate resilience in projects, um, being climate um, adaptive, you know, being responsive to climate needs. And it was expected that the project would take, for example, 17,000 cars off the road daily, just in this Northern part of the DC area, or if you want to call it the Southern part of the Maryland um, region. Um, that it would save 1 million um, gallons of gas or petrol, as you might call it in certain parts of the world over 20 years. It was going to be run by electricity, so it meant no polluting air emissions. And it would also connect existing rights of ways, roadways, maximize land use and water resources. Um, those of you who've ever been in DC may not realize this, but DC is a traffic nightmare. I live 10 miles away from downtown DC. And it's not uncommon for me to actually sometimes be stuck in traffic for an hour and a half as I look at um, trying to get around the traffic. So it's a 16 mile project and a loop to connect different parts of the metro system. It was launched as a 36 year PPP. The completion date was set for the first phase of 2022. It included 21 stations and was going to be and is was seen as an economic contributor to Montgomery and Prince George's counties wherein it lies. It also enjoyed considerable political support. Um, what also happened was that um, it was launched as a PPP because parties um, uh, there was a shortage of public funds and so it is typical you know addressing the infrastructure gap it offers a promise to be innovative and type saving There was opposition from some residents and they were supporters. But those who supported it felt that it would alleviate traffic problems and those who strongly were against it. And there was quite a vocal group was because of environmental concerns. Um, there were two um, parties that were involved, which is really important to understand in this context. 
One was the sense of, I mean, one was the um, EPC contractor consortium known as the PLTC and it consisted of very large um, construction companies in the United States, floor lane, con lane contract um, contract contractors and the Taylor brothers. But there was also the, um, the lenders consortium and unfortunately, the acronyms are pretty much the same, called PLT, Purple Line Transit Partners, which included Meridium um, Floor again and um, Star America. And so we had two groups. So if you look at the stakeholders, we had the interested parties, we had the communities, we had the public sector and different um, public sector entities. And we also had, you know, in the consortium itself or the, the special purpose vehicle or the project company. So challenges were um, immediately um, started surfacing. I was involved with the project just tangentially right at the beginning where the company that I worked with was involved in the visualization and conceptualization of the um, project. Um, one of the complaints was that financial risk was, more financial risk was taken over by the state than it should have been. And this um, proved to be true later on. Um, there was also a low bid construction contract selection. This is not unusual, but you know, often PPPs are not always the cheapest, so you shouldn't just look for the lowest bid. There were project delays, environmental challenges. The environmental lobby in the DC area really challenged the project with numerous court cases, which resulted in delays, cost overruns, et cetera. There was also disagreements between the, um, the EPC contractor and the Maryland Department of Transportation and the Maryland Transport Authority. And so there was um, you know, conflict, different expectations. Unfortunately, what resulted was a whole series of legal actions that were launched and um, litigation started happening. Early on today, we had a session where one of the things that was talked about was, you know, contract, I mean, conflict resolution or conflict mitigation. And the aspect there was also making sure that you can avoid an escalation of challenges and problems. Unfortunately, this project was not, um, well, the, the managers of the project, you know, chose in some an unfortunate way to, um, sorry, not uh, manage this very well. And the result was that the project was reached a stage of 2.5 years delay and also $519 million in overall project costs. So this was on top of the overall $5 billion cost of the project, which in many cases is rather astounding because many countries would be pretty impressed if they were launching a project that was going to be for $519 million. So things started falling apart pretty quickly We'd reached the stage where, at, and this was a year ago, it's even more now, there was 976 days in delays for various reasons, you know, different parties could be blamed for it. But again, the stakeholders weren't working closely together, they weren't communicating, and so it resulted in delay after delay. The result was that the project company said, with because of all the delays, and you can imagine this impact that it was having on costs of the project, that they weren't able to, um, to complete the project under the current circumstances, because it was unable to obtain the time and cost relief to which it felt it was entitled to under the contract. The, um, the contractor then notified that it needed an additional $187 million, quite a sum, and also extra five months and this became a major contention point and the stakeholders again were not communicating well, they were not talking well, and negotiations broke down and the contractor announced essentially that it was going to step away from the project as it was allowed to according to its understanding of the contract and that it would vacate the site between 60 and 90 days which caused tremendous concern because of safety issues. You can't just leave infrastructure unfinished and um, left open to the elements and to people that could um, be involved. And the other problem that result between two of the specific stakeholders here, who were more in, you know, in the partner sense, was that um, the, um, the, uh, the construction element and the investor element suddenly found themselves disconnected and the investors had to scramble to find a new construction firm. People were saying, why is this project going? You know, said, stop it. You know, this is not making any sense. We're throwing money at a failing project. And people started trying to strategize, I think about two and a half years later than they should have on what could be done. One was looking at different scenarios that included canceling the project. 
the state taking over the project, finding a new private partner, and also reaching agreement with the existing contract and meeting their, their requests, their demands, and their terms. No matter what the scenario was going to be, however, the state would still have to throw money at the project to save it, and this was unbudgeted. And the question was asked, you know, did it make any more sense? The consequence is that the state did not agree. So there was an escalation and a breakdown in communication between the stakeholders. They did not agree with the $519 million assessment and cost overruns. The contract also said, you know, we're looking at 2022 for the first phase to be completed. They said there's no ways it would only be able to be completed by 2025. And so the contractor stepped away and the project stalled and there was great drama. The, the construction sites had to be secured. Everyone was upset, and this was a reputational risk as well for the different parties who were involved, and it gave PPPs, unfortunately, in Maryland a black eye. The question we have to ask then is what could have been done better? I think if the um, people who were running the project had the manual, they would have been the new handbook that we've talked about, they would have been able to find many of the answers. But it seems that you know, from the beginning and very early on the project, there was divergent expectations between the stakeholders. There were un, you know, unrealistic expectations maybe. And the big element of the environmental concerns between the outside stakeholders and the parties to the contract should have been resolved before the project was launched. Um, there was, you know, better stakeholder con consultation would have helped. And in this case, it would have helped as the parties were unable to communicate with one another and to avoid, you know, tensions that it would have been better maybe to have an outside body to come in and help them. Um, it seems that, you know, there was a trust factor problem from the beginning. You know, the, pro the protocols for contract resolution don't seem to be followed, or if they did, they weren't well, uh, well defined. Um, MDOT and MTA should have been more assertive in its project monitoring. It's, it's kind of unbelievable that the project got as far as it did before anyone realized that um, it was in trouble. The consortia should have been more a cohesive team, and project risks possibly should have been more cohesively allocated. There's a postscript. This is quite a recent one. So you can remember this started two and a half years ago. And now we are September. This is an article that appeared in the newspaper last week, September the 9th. And it says, you know, we are you know, searching for new a purple line contractor. So what has happened is the project has almost been rebid. So the investors have stayed the same, but the contractor or the, the, the construction contractor stepped away, as I mentioned earlier on, and now there's efforts to look for a new one. Hopefully by December this year, it will be chosen. There's also, you know, the fact that the, um, the new contract will only be finalized in 2022, and that was about the time when everyone is expecting the project to be finished. This means that there'll have to be a new timeline, new cost estimates will have to be done, and we have to find a way to make up the delays of the project since 2020. There are still $700 million in unpaid over, overrun costs. And also, the, for example, the Board of Public Works got involved to so another stakeholder who has to agree on what's going to happen. In my closing comments, I would just like to point out that um, this is maybe a good example for those who have grappled with challenges in projects. And you know, take a look at my LinkedIn site to read the full article. But it's important that you know we need to... to have stakeholders being more focused on being enablers and innovators. Um, there's also a need that, you know, we need to have formal participation. And in this case also, even though the environmental lobby, which resulted in major delays in the project, had a voice, there should have been some way to find to um, ameliorate or to mitigate their concerns that there wasn't this massive breakdown. It's important that all formal partners also have good communication. And it's also important that the outside bodies have a voice and also that there are varying degrees of commitment and interest in the project which need to be accommodated. And finally, it's important, as um, we have seen, to enhance communication at all times, set expectations and build trusts. Thank you very much. And um, that is the end of um, my presentation. Thank you, David, uh, very much for this presentation and for bringing in the practical case of uh, how things went wrong and what they could have been improved. I think it's very useful to, to our practitioners here. 
Um, I see that there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I know Delfina, uh, you have your hand raised, but I think Jan uh, shared a question before in the chat. So perhaps uh, Jan, if you want to please unmute yourself, uh, turn on your video and ask the question. Yes, um, I happily do that. Um, my question was that um, what I see that in, um, in the overall policy documents, there is a lot of emphasis on stakeholders. And, and just to assure everybody, I'm not against stakeholders, but um, in, in real practice in, the, in a project, I think we um, uh, should um, distinguish between which stakeholder, the, 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 the level of influence that each stakeholder has or is allowed to have. What I, what I see with larger projects, especially PPP projects, that um, a, a lot of NGOs are there and um, they, they do their statements and that's good that's there, but I think that the, the local community is sometimes left out because they're not well organized. So individual speakers that will swarm in the, 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 the good organized NGOs. And I'm always worried that the end user, the user of the project, a little bit left behind. I have no solution, but I sometimes feel that I'm left behind. And maybe David has some experience or some suggestions to get those end users of our, our products, our development, our roads, our storm surge, our hospitals, our climate resilient infrastructure, uh, be part of that stakeholder engagement. Thank you, Jan. Um, one thing that happened early on the project, they held a series of townhouse meetings. I'm not sure what you call them in Europe, but um, basically there were forums that were held where parties could express their concerns and interests. Um, I think, you know, and I, I don't want to defend the project or be against it or for it in any specific way, but, you know, there was, I think, a bit of a very vocal group of people, a small group, that then escalated the environmental concerns of the project to a point that it actually stopped the project. And they were, you know, hell bent on stopping the project, not finding ways to help the project move forward. And so, you know, the question was, were they being disingenuous? Were they really concerned? Were they, you know, making suggestions? The other, the certain area where this project was being built in Maryland is a very affluent area. It's on the outskirts of the metropolitan, of the DC um, federal area. So um, the, 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 the comment was made that, you know, we're gonna build this project um, along existing rights of ways. It was essentially gonna be about a brownfield project, et cetera. And yet, you know, there were wealthy people in very well-to-do neighborhoods that um, got very upset about the impacts that it was going to have. And, you know, many of those, unfortunately, were people, users who would never use the public transport. You know, so the communities that it was being directed, which would live in less affluent areas, which would give them, you know, connectivity, the metro, um, were not, you know, not having a voice, as you said. So I, I think, you know, I can't say much more than other than, you know, report backs that I heard from the townhouses or town meetings that maybe there were hints of what could go wrong that should have been more carefully listened to and mitigated because in the end, there was a small group of stakeholders that paralyzed the project, you know, with numerous court cases, which went on and on and on. And so um, what can we do, you know, listen carefully, but Jan, I agree very much with the statement that you made, that it's important. And I also said that early on in my presentation, this fine balance is important in understanding the roles, the responsibilities, the expectations, you know, where you, what's gonna happen and how far stakeholders can push and how far stakers can be accommodated. And specifically when it comes to the partners of projects, you know, the formal partners, the quickest way to scare off investors would be as if um, investors got a sense that the project wasn't going to be run by the project team or their, their special purpose vehicle, but it was going to be run by outside groups. So again, stakeholders, important. We can't avoid them. We do need to work with them. And I don't mean we can't, can't avoid them in an exasperated method means we do need to engage them. But these ground rules, if you can call it that, need to be clearly defined in the stakeholder engagement plan or strategy so that all parties understand where things stand. 
Thank you a lot, uh, David, for, for the explanation and you, for, the, for the question. Um, I, I will now give the, the words to Delfina. Uh, and while I do that, I just wanted to kindly ask everyone also to please uh, share questions now both to, to David as well as to Gisela and Felipe. Uh, and as you do that, I'll be able to, to give you the word uh, after this question from Delfina. And so you can also ask to all the speakers. Thank you very much, and Delfina, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, David, for presenting the case. Um, it generated many frustrations as I kept hearing you because it reminded me of so many cases that I've seen as, use, as a user, not, not only as a professional. Um, and a few comments. One, uh, and building a little bit on what Ian was bringing about, is... Um, all what's social license to operate, the mining sector has worked a lot on that. And I think that's a, yeah, like a, a resource that we need to see and maybe it's useful in cases like that. Then um, in terms of Ian's question and the fact that not every stakeholder has the same um, weight and stuff and also the the issue of how genuine the concerns are, and that's always sometimes some players use the agenda of other groups just to push their uh, hidden agenda. Um, I would recur to the concept of materiality that it may be useful. Uh, the concept of materiality is quite used in the space of sustainable finance and impact investment, and it's when you're assessing risks and opportunities of mostly risk, you assess which are the risks that are really core to whatever project you're working on or whatever investment you're pushing forward. And then you start assessing different levels of materiality. Um, and I think that's kind of an approach that could help uh, to put in order at the beginning and early on the, the stakeholders. Um, and then the other thing is I would bring up the fact that the early stakeholder engagement is not necessarily to avoid the problems, but it's having the tools and the knowledge to address and manage the, the things that may arise because people and groups can raise their voices because they're, um, they're not, they don't agree with the project at any stage. But if you have an early stakeholder engagement, it's also a way to know where all the stakeholders are standing and you could see leads on where, what may come up. So I think that's an important thing. And then concerning the low, low bid, did you mean low, lower price bid? So there was, um, you know, due to political pressure to move the project forward and expectations that, you know, these projects were gonna be incredibly expensive, that there is a perception, you know, I can't prove it, and it's just been stated in the press, that maybe the company that won made a lower bid so that the, you know, people who are attacking the governor of Maryland or the exorbitant cost of this project could say, look, the project is not gonna be that expensive. But um, I think that was part of the issue. One thing that you did also point out, which is interesting is, you know, understanding the context of the concerns of stakeholders, which can vary between countries. So we shouldn't just put it all through the same sort of filter or magnifying glass, because a project like this, I think in Europe, in a very green conscious city would have been fully embraced and people would have, you know, worked on it. While in the United States where everyone relies on their cars and there's much more individualism and not in my backyard ment <laughs> mentalities and things like the NIMBY approach, um, a very small vocal group, you know, became a enormous voice over the project. So, you know, we have to look at this very, very carefully and understand, you know, how we can um, take it further. So I hope that helped. Um, I do have, Danilo, a question, if I can yeah. ask Giselle a um, question quickly, if that's possible. Uh, yes, uh, I actually would, if, you, if I may, David, uh, just I think Doreen uh, was, was waiting a bit for, for okay. some time. Uh, so I will, I will bring back to you in a second. Uh, so as we move now then to the open discussions, I would like to ask Doreen if you could please uh, unmute yourself and ask the questions to, to Giselle and Felipe, and then David, uh, I will give back to you. Thank you. 
Uh, sure. Uh, thanks very much, Danilo, and thanks very much to all the presenters. Um, I originally had this question for Giselle and Felipe, but of course I would welcome any uh, feedback uh, from David. Um, I was wondering whether you had any thoughts or advice um, on engaging um, the private sector, and by that I really mean engaging bidders to come forward to participate in less mainstream um, PPP uh, projects, such as affordable housing. I mean, the bidding market, they're very familiar with, um, you know, roads and hospitals and so on. But when it comes to projects such as affordable housing, um, that might not be, you know, quite as popular or, um, you know, welcome. Um, and I guess related to that, I was wondering whether you might have um, any examples of um, successful or unsuccessful projects um, involving um, affordable housing. Thank you. Um, I have to say I have less experience with affordable housing, but uh, more so with what we call social infrastructure, which really touches more on um, schools and hospitals. Um, and there, um, um, yes, I mean, I think it's a, a really important sector for PPPs. Um, uh, when I think about, again, I'm trying to bring it back into kind of the adaptation climate resilience factors. I think the things that we're also beginning to think through more actively is how do we design um, these projects uh, in ways that will capture um, um, the resilience that needs to, to be there. Um, I mentioned to you earlier, uh, I think an example with the um, airport project uh, that we were doing in um, uh, and there we embedded um, a LEED certification. Um, clearly there's a number, IFC has um, EDGE certification, which also goes to building resiliency uh, and kind of efficiencies uh, as well. So there's other factors that, that like water use, et cetera. Um, so I think those become very important um, factors across the board, but uh, clearly in areas where social infrastructure um, is embedded as well. Uh, I'm sure David has a lot uh, to say, perhaps on the stakeholder engagement, very much on that side. So I'll, I'll leave it over to you or Philippe. I don't know if you had anything else to add on that. Thank you. Um, ironically, I am involved with a client in another country on um, affordable housing or social housing. And there's a big debate. And I think with the first thing that's really important is to really distinguish by what you mean by social housing and secondly, what you mean by affordable housing. Um, people use those two terms, you know, they interuse them. And I think they're quite different. You know, social housing is providing housing for people who can't afford it. You know, and I, in that sense, um, you, you have to, you know, work very carefully with stakeholders and specifically have a good outreach or market outreach to the private sector so that they understand what their role is going to be. And that is a certain sort of corporate social responsibility also that's going to be involved in these type of projects. And so, you know, one thing that I do stress with PPPs, you know, that the private sector has to make a bit of a profit, you know, I mean, that's, you know, and profit is not a bad thing. And so if you don't structure those agreements for, you know, let's say social housing clearly and carefully and manage it. And, you know, if a company comes along and it does a good project and it delivers, but then it's looked upon badly as the big bad wolf because it's making profit and that's exploitation and all sorts of things, you're going to chase investors away. Affordable housing is a big debate because affordable housing, especially in the United States, is not just for poor people. You know, if you go to even DC, it's extremely exp expensive, Seattle, Portland, in California. So, you know, the, the whole debate there is, you know, affordable housing, you know, so, you know, can you build housing that doesn't have to be a million dollars? Could it be maybe $500,000 a unit? That might be a little bit more attractive to the private sector because, you know, people are looking for a very quick solution and they are people that are willing to pay. So I don't know if that's helped, but that's just, you know, there's this whole debate of affordable housing, social housing, how do you reach out? You know, who's the big bad wolf? You know, who's the friend? You know, is this a corporate social responsibility effort? And I think one area that is also important is that sometimes you need to not confuse public-private partnerships that are philanthropic in nature with traditional PPPs, because if it's done as a philanthropy, that's a partnership between the public and the private sector, that's quite different to a public-private partnership, which is done 
as a contractual agreement under those terms and traditional what I would, I'm sure the IFC and the World Bank, et cetera, consider a public-private partnership to be. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, definitely uh, helpful comments. I mean, in the context I was referring to, it's really, I guess, what you're referring to as social housing, although, as you say, those terms are quite um, used, quite interchangeable, but it's really social housing and not a philanthropic um, type of endeavor, but a true PPP contractual uh, relationship. But thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that. So now, uh, David, if you want to ask your question, then we have a question from uh, Brandon coming up. Uh, Delfina, and if anyone else has uh, other questions that you want to share, please do so in the in the chat. Thank you, David. To you. Well, um, one thing that you were talking about, which I found you know very interesting, you know, you you touched on the insurance industry, and you know the you know now every two years instead of every five hundred years, etc., and that and that the whole mindset of the insurance industry with climate resilience is changing. I wanted to ask, you know, have, has there been thought on what is the breaking point for the insurance industry? And then the question is, if they do reach the breaking point, what are the consequences? And I know that's kind of a controversial question, but it's something that I grapple with all the time. Excellent questions. And the reason we wanted to start off with some of those headline figures, the 183 billion in insurance costs estimated up to um, those dates, is because um, these companies are beginning to analyze climate risk and what they're seeing is losses escalating. So I think the concern that we probably all share is um, that question that you're asking, what's the tipping point where insurance premiums skyrocket to make um, insurance unattainable or um, you, start carve, you start carving out certain events? Um, so I, I think there's, a, I don't have the answers um, I think we're probably speeding to um, some of these tipping points uh, as we speak. Um, the fact that uh, large giants like Swiss Re are beginning to analyze this uh, means that they're beginning to think about what it means for their premiums and they're seeing them escalate and what that means for potential carve outs uh, uh, as well. So I think um, what it's also probably going to shift us into thinking what more and more, and not just as a nice to have, but as a must to have, how are we uh, driving resilience and uh, designing this into contracts, into the infrastructure that we're, we're financing? Uh, because without that, I suspect you may not even be able to, uh, in the future, actually get insurance. So um, these are some of the when I say again, things are evolving so rapidly, these are some of the things that uh, we really should all be watching. Thank you. Thank you for that. So now uh, I would like to give the floor to, to Brandon. Brandon, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, turn on the camera and ask the question, please. Thank you, Danilo. Um, well, sorry for not having my, my camera on earlier. I'm actually working from home today. Um, but thank you for the wonderful presentations. That's been um, hugely insightful. Um, David, I've actually been a, a follower of yours on LinkedIn for a while. I guess you call me an ideologue of your, your thinking of, of stakeholder engagement. So I guess my, my question um, is regarding um, community consultation as a specific subcategory of stakeholders. We do a lot of work in donor funded projects um, in, in sensitive areas where services historically have not been paid for by users. So have you got any success stories or, um, or uh, risks that you would watch out for in terms of how to um, navigate that minefield of, of properly structuring projects and ensuring communities have a voice in that process? Um, so the country that I won't mention that I'm working in, which is working with a big project, um, you know, sold their, their, their housing project, for example, as a, you know, a social housing, but they actually called it affordable, which unfortunately with the escalation of costs and the material costs, et cetera, and then the impact of the pandemic, which delayed the project and all of that, the social housing rapidly became unaffordable housing for all parties. And I think, you know, what happened was that um, they could have done a better job in reaching out to the community of those who would be housed in the project. And, you know, in understanding what they would look like, you know, how they would be designed. Um, the, the result of this, you know, with maybe cost cutting and expenses to, um, you know, to make it fit now because it was becoming more expensive than that. They were building units that could house thousands of people, but, you know, 
two elevators in a building for 3,000 people, you know, um, things like that. And so, uh, and then waiting lists for people to be on, you know, who was going to get into this housing. And the end result was that, you know, accusations started being made that it was going to favor parties and people and all sorts of things. And I'm sure you, you've experienced these, uh, Brendan, but I think, you know, again, absolute transparency, you know, in the messaging, absolute transparency in everything. Because as soon as you even hide one little bit of information, you start creating a rumor mill, which can then just undermine the project. And, uh, it, you know, a project that has really good intentions could become untenable. And so, you know, it's, as you said, you know, we have almost if you want to call it hierarchy of stakeholders in the sense that you know the top dogs in a ppp for example are going to be the you know the, the contracted parties and then you know sometimes you start forgetting about the end users and it you know filters down until you get to almost no communication or ironically consultation with the users you know the people who are going to live there and um you know my experience is over communicate if, if that makes any sense over communicate share even the mundane because there are people who want to know what the mundane is but they're also people who just want to know the general and don't promise what you can't thank you fantastic thank you for that so uh just trying to squeeze in some of the questions that are still uh here in the chat uh kk you had uh, a question about uh, how that really experience with uh, accommodation for university students. Perhaps you would like to, to explain a bit better your question and, and ask, I, I think it was for, for David. Yes, um, thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, I, I was very much interested in the affordable housing discussion and then the, the distinction that is usually made between social housing and then affordable housing. I think that has been one of the main challenges for us as an institution and as a country in terms of even trying to define what it is and what category of people are supposed to go in for affordable and then who is supposed to be classified under social housing. The other one that um, we've actually been confronted with for as an institution in the past few months has to do with um, students' accommodation. You have a situation where you have a number of secondary schools. Most people would want to go to the university accommodation, but it's, we have limited space. Um, so I would want to find out what the experience has been in the past in terms of PPP, where a situation where a public university concession to a private individual to build or create it over a period of time, say 20, 25 years, and then hand it over to the university. What the experience has been in the past, and if you've ever had any um, um, encounters so far as uh, students, accommodation is concerned and what your advice would be. So um, in the United States, surprisingly enough, a very high percentage of student accommodation at universities is being done through sort of concession agreements or PPPs, if you want to call them that. And, I, um, and what has happened is it's worked quite successfully as long as students could pay. And I think that's, you know, the big challenge because Again, the, the concessionaire, the operator of the student housing is wants to make a certain amount of profit. And it's worked well, but what has recently happened and the press in the United States is full of it and quite alive with it, is during the pandemic, suddenly students were sent home in their thousands or hundreds of thousands. And now you have this housing that is not being um, occupied, students aren't paying to be there. And the concessionaires or the PPPs have gotten into trouble because it's through something that's totally not their, um, their fault, okay? But here they're facing the situation. And I think that even ties into, you know, maybe, you know, Philippe and some of the things where you're talking about force majeure events and things like that is, you know, do we have to now, when we start looking at student housing and accommodation, military housing, medical, hospital housing, you know, all these type of housing offers, if it's operated, you know, who's to blame and what happens when these projects, um, you know, fail because of something like a pandemic? Um, or if it's built in a bad place and there's a hurricane or a flood or something and it destroys the housing, you know, who's responsible. But, um, you know, if you are looking, um, uh, quite, quite, quite well, if you are looking for um, um, examples, 
there's a lot to be seen, specifically in the United States. I'm not sure maybe even in Europe with student housing that's been followed. But um, if you did like student housing, PPPs, you know, that type of Google search in and you say USA or something like that, you'll be amazed how many pop up and how many examples there are. So I hope that helps. Yes, okay, that's great. Right. Thank you. And I know that we are running a bit over time, but I think that everyone agrees that the discussion is, is quite interesting. So perhaps just one last question. Uh, Felipe, would you, you send me on the chat, the chat, sorry. Would you like to perhaps ask your question? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, David, I had um, a point on, you, you mentioned the overlap between the different type of stakeholders. Um, and in fact, the, the, we can uh, think of cases where it's not only about managing the risk of the different stakeholders, but even they can become partners. Uh, a concrete case I have is, for instance, in, in BRTs, uh, where we, we've been thinking of what to do with the bus operators in the previous system, in, even more when it's about uh, informal uh, um, uh, transport. Um, a question which is maybe more of a comment at the same time is just, do you have other cases where we uh, we can have this overlap and turn it into positive um, situations that can in fact even enhance the 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 the, the PPP itself? Um, yes, one I'll touch very briefly because I know the time is um, tight. But the Army Corps of Engineers, for example, has been looking at um, along the Mississippi River with its movements of you know the barges and the locks and all of that, which have been put under tremendous risk due to drought at times and floods at times. That they started reaching out to multiple stakeholders, but not just so the shipping companies, but the communities around them, for example, and so. Um, you know, that, that, that blurring, you know, in some ways still exists, but it's now, you know, the, the parties have collaborated, cooperated. So for example, I know in one situation, there was a lock that desperately had to be replaced. If it wasn't going to be replaced, there was going to be a problem that the lock would shut down, but that meant that grain producers upriver on the Mississippi would not be able to um, export grain, you know, down to the Gulf and out of the country. So they stepped in as a stakeholder and started making you know, financing available, et cetera, out of their own resources to ensure that this lock didn't fail and that it wasn't you know, shut down. Because if you shut down one of those major locks, shipping on the Mississippi will come to a dead standstill. So I think you know, as different parties become more involved and they get more impacted directly, I think you're gonna find this situation that you know, additional stakeholders are gonna be involved and uh, whether it's voluntary or not, or just a matter of choice or survival. But I think that that, that, that definitely is gonna happen. So not just the traditional stakeholders we think about, but stakeholders you wouldn't have even thought of. Great, thank you for that. And apologies for some of the questions that are still in the chat and uh, were not answered. Uh, we'll make sure to write this down and send to the respective speakers so we can also address uh, all the points. Uh, to conclude this session, I'd just like to thank again uh, Giselle, Felipe, and David for like uh, very useful insights and also for all the participants for, for bringing in uh, very interesting questions. I think that really helped the, the discussion. Uh, and I would like now actually to invite everyone just to turn on their cameras uh, so we can have that uh, quick picture to, to register the closing of the session. So while you do that, uh, I would like just to then Max, if you can please coordinate uh, the picture. And then after that, uh, we will have a short break and then be back to the group activities. So please Max, if you can just coordinate the picture. Yep, so we'll just Everyone. wait a second for everyone to turn on their cameras. Or for the majority anyway. I think that's the most we're going to get. So if everybody could smile at their camera real quick for a few seconds. Thank you very much. That was it. Thank you, uh, Giselle, Felipe, David. One 10 seconds uh, comment to close the session. Thank you. Uh, a big thank you to you uh, for the invitation and wonderful to be all um, here with all of you. Um, this is a really exciting time. And I think climate change is, is really the key agenda going forward. Um, so big thank you. Thank you. Felipe? And yes, a, a big thanks too. And this has been a great cooperation with GC on the work that we, we, we've been doing together. Um, and yes, I mean, not only climate change is of course uh, an important uh, 
agenda, but we also need everyone to be mobilized because these will be new areas to um, to look at where we don't always have um, the, the 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 lessons learned already and and the right uh, decisions. So uh, so um, yeah, just uh, good luck to all of us on on, on on this thinking. Thank you, David. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And just on stakeholders, my one observation that has always astounded me is that engaging with stakeholders reveals information about projects that you would never have thought of or even experienced unless you engaged with them. So don't discount them. Great. I think couldn't have a better way.